Welcome to the Modern Stock Car Cup Tour here from Bristol Motor Speedway. We are here for the iHeartRadio 500 and our first of two races from the world's fastest half mile. We see Armin Salvador making his second straight appearance on the pole as he actually started first at Indianapolis and won at Indianapolis. Of course, if you are a diehard follower of the MSCCT or even just a spectator, you know that there is a historic streak going on in our league where we have had nine different races with nine unique winners. Some of the people near the front today have a chance to change that. As we said, Armin Salvador is your pole sitter. Starting back in eighth is Doug Doring, who won at Pocono. Starting at tenth is Creed Daniel, who won at uh, Darlington. Starting back at 15th is Santiago Alvarez, who won at Charlotte. And then starting back, let's even see here. And then you have near the rear of the field, Agristo Papa Georges, who won at Watkins Glen. Let's take a look at the driver command. Drivers, start your engines. Well, you heard her there as now all 42 cars for the IR Radio 250 or 500, I keep getting the uh, name wrong, we'll head off of pit lane. It's time to take a look at our starting lineup. In row one, we have Armin Salvador and Nolo Hamilton. Row two, we have Luis Aguilar and Faris Khalil. Row three, we have Ian Korob and Nelson Reeves. Row four, we have Doug Doring and Chase Buck. Row five, we have Ethan Mitchell and Creed Daniel. Row six, we have Patrick Starr and David Iller. Row seven, we have Vincent Crook and Jay Bird. Row 8, we have Santiago Alvarez and Dakota Bennett. Row 9, we have Arthur Xavier and Stephanie Larson. And row 10, we have Jay Monin and somebody. They're having some trouble uh, filling in the spot. But in any case, back to the start-finish line, we have a green flag here from the iHeartRadio 500. Armin Salvador already jumping out to a lead as Nolo Hamilton takes that lead going off of turn number 2. Nolo Hamilton, the native of Ontario, Canada, will lead the first lap here for the Motor Speedway. They call it the world's fastest half mile for a reason. The actual fastest lap time for Armin Salvador when he was doing qualifying was quite literally 15.095. Uh, it actually even, I think, bested the NASCAR record that Ryan Newman set back in 2003, but unfortunately for Armin, losing a lot of spots here quickly in the inside line. So yeah, Armin Salvador, who was your pole sitter, is now outside of the top 10, or excuse me, outside of the top 5. As now the tandem running 1 and 2 are two natives of the same province in the same country, the natives of Ontario, Canada. Um, Nolo Hamilton and Faris Khalil, both running 1-2. Faris Khalil had a rather rough start to the season. He wrecked out at Daytona and then did a start and park at Homestead, but has been able to rebound somewhat lately, and uh, at, even at one point after finishing well at Charlotte, made himself into the top 15 points. However, he hasn't really been able to uh, capitalize on his opportunities as, as we take a look at the top five right now. We have Nolo Hamilton, who is a chef. We have Faris Khalil, who is a uh, Toyota. Doug Doring, who is a Pontiac. Nelson Reeves, who is a Ford. And, um, and David Iller, who is a Chevy as well. The nearest Dodge to the front of the field is Jay Monin, who is, uh, your, he is one of our short track racers in real life. He runs street stocks and mod lights in Alabama and the surrounding southeastern states. Uh, our other short track racer who also runs a Dodge is Ryan Adema, who's running mid-pack around 23rd. He races sprint cars in Florida in the Southern Sprint Car Shootout. Take a look at him in episode 11 of the Dan Wilkins Show coming up in a few weeks. As we talk about a lot of things involving the sprint cars, we even talk about this league a little bit. It'll definitely be exciting to watch um, what he's got to offer. Uh, in that interview that, that we conducted back in August and um, I believe it was September that we conducted the interview, my apologies, but as we go on to lap 11 of the iHeartRadio 500, your pole sitter is in 11th place. Armin Salvador not really having the best afternoon here from Bristol. 
As we finally encounter some lap traffic, you can see there's Andre Peters, the native of Romania, running in the second. Nolo Hamilton behind him and Doug Doring sliding into the second position. Nelson Reeves has been uh, attendance, attending to run the high line this afternoon and in some cases it has worked and it looks like it's going to work even better now as he's going to slide into the second position passing Doug Doring. Let's take a look from his cockpit. Nelson Reeves, who is part of Martini Racing, teammates with Kestudis Ramonis, one of our European drivers who is from the UK, born in Lithuania. So his teammate Ramonis is currently running 21st. He's running around even keel with Ryan Adema and Stephanie Larson. Now, Faris Khalil, who started third, is now down to fifth. And look at this guy, Jay Bird. He's been running around mid pack all year. He's one of our guys who returned from season one. He didn't really make too much of an impact, but he did make a name for himself when he finished second at the Daytona 500 behind Dan Wilkins in the number 77 car. He finished second after, once again, running about mid pack all day for Bird Motorsports. And, you know, really, for, for Bird, he's really been looking for redemption. He's got an outside shot looking in for the All-Star Race, which will be held at Bowman Gray Stadium in between the races 13 and 14 um, after Texas with the AT&T 500. That will be when we have our All-Star Race in North Carolina at the famous quarter-mile track known as Bowman Gray Stadium. Now, it seems like today it really seems like the outside line has been rating superior. As you see... Faris Kula making that pass over Jay Bird uh, via the outside line. And Andre Peters really holding off the leaders here. He is refusing to give way to them as we've had about five laps of intense battling as Nolo Hamilton finally jumps to the inside to try to make a pass. And it won't work as the eight car of Andre Peters, he does block once again. Nelson Reeves in second, David Iller in third, and another guy who's looking for redemption, David Iller. He was your pole sitter at Martinsville for the Dollar Tree Park. But then on lap 30 following a restart, got black flagged for jumping the restart. That gave way to Ryan Adema, who eventually took the lead and won the race in that chaotic event, which had 14 cautions, which is the MSC and he will come off of turn number four. He will be your new race leader. David Iller takes the lead on lap 23. Luis Aguilar followed behind him in second in that number 55 Dogecoin Dodge. He's been running really well all day. He was running pretty well at Watkins Glen and Indianapolis, but unfortunately Watkins Glen had a bad pit stop and rather bad pit strategy that led him to lose that race and finish a lap down. So now he's basically tandeming up with David Iller as Andre Peters still continues to protest and not move out of the way even though he is officially a lap down. It's costing these guys a lot. I mean, Armin Salvador, who was your pole sitter, is now in 11th. He's behind Ian Korob and ahead of Kyle Driscoll. But then you see other guys who were competitive, like Nolo Hamilton dropping from first to third after leading uh, so many times. And now it's a battle between Jay and Jay. Jay Monin in the number 60 and Jay Bird in the number 15. Two completely different types of drivers, two completely different types of personalities on and off the track. These are two very exciting drivers to watch, especially Monin. You know, remember with, with Jay Monin finishing fourth at Daytona, he is mostly a short track guy, but he, he's known for being rather uh, notoriously bad or rather um, distasteful of road courses. He's not a fan of road courses in any way. But for Monin, he happened to get a uh, good luck of the draw and finish 12 at Watkins Glen. Now, of course, with Monin, he's had extremely, and I mean extremely bad luck this year. At Darlington and Charlotte, he wrecked out. In fact, he blew his engine at Charlotte. He finished last at Martinsville after uh, going in, in in an early crash. And then at Pocono, once again, blew an engine. And Watkins Glen, as we said, he finished 12th. And then he also had a, another wreck 
at Indianapolis. He's sort of like Steve Park uh, when it comes to this league, if, I, if I'm going to make a comparison here. Because he's the kind of guy that, yeah, he does, um, he does have talent. But he gets extremely unlucky. And remember, he's got good equipment, too. He is with Daniel Lopez Racing, which has some of the best equipment in the entire league. So you have to wonder, is that going to play a role in how he performs and how he runs? With Jamon and being a native of Ohio and recently uh, converting to... Or I shouldn't say converting. Uh, he moved to Alabama a few years ago. So now, of course, all eyes are set for when we go to Talladega on race 12. After the IR Radio 500, we have the SunTrust 400, which is at Atlanta Motor Speedway, and then the Books A Million 500, which is at Talladega. So you gotta wonder, will that be a good race for Jay Monin? He's known for being good on the Super Speedway and the short tracks. I know that the Super Speedways and the short tracks are very differing uh, types of tracks. But they definitely are uh, the two bright spots in this season for Jay Monin. With him finishing fourth at Daytona, despite being several seconds behind the leaders, it still makes you wonder, will he have a rebound in the second half? He goes to the inside of Jay Bird here. It's like he could make a pass, but he's going to get stuck behind that eight car of Andre Peters. So let's go back to the lead now and see what's popping over there. As you can see, David Iller still remains the race leader with a rather substantial gain, uh, with a rather substantial lead over Doug Doring and Farris Blow, who are running three and four. But as we said, the high line has really reigned superior this afternoon, with that pass from David Iller to take the lead being made on the outside and several other passes also being made on the outside as well. Uh, if there's anything good about Bristol Racing, it's that you always like to see the multi-grooves. You always like to see them work out, and you always like to see that sort of come into play. And that's really what's been happening today. The outside line has just happened to be a better line to run than the inside line. As they come up on Carl McKinney here running through the first. You gotta wonder, for a guy like Vincent Crook, who's currently running 40th right now, you have to wonder, was his dominant performance at Indianapolis just a fluke? In his first ever MSCCT race, he finished 4th uh, in the number 12 Ford. And, and, and Crook is, is a good driver, and he, even though he qualified around mid-pack, that's still impressive because you remember you have to make upgrades in this league. So if you don't make upgrades, you're not going to really be a standout driver and you're not really going to compete in the pack. So if you're a guy like Vincent Crook and in your first ever race you get a top five, that's really going to attract a lot of teams into saying, hey, we want you on our team. And as he moves up a few positions here, he, he, he is not a lap down yet, but he probably will be soon. But just some surprising faces near the rear of the field this afternoon. Dan Wilkins in 40th, Bradley Wilmington uh, in 38th, Darian Arnsdorf, your points leader, running near the back of the pack as well. And remember, Darian Arnsdorf has dominated on short tracks this year. He had a top five at Martinsville, even won the race at Walt Disney World. And even though this is the first short track in quite a few races, he seems to not really have it locked down. He also didn't have a qualifying performance, but a lot of people really struggled during qualifying. They struggled to make up ground, they struggled to uh, gain positions, and just overall, they had an overall uh, sucky day. So if you want to take a look at it from that perspective, it's definitely interesting. Oh, as we see a little bit of a spin, Darian Arnsdorf and Mitchell Collins get tangled up and the caution comes out. They race back to the line as David Iller is your race leader as we go under caution for the first time. So Darian Arnsdorf and Mitchell Collins end up getting tangled up on the backstretch as they were a lap down. So let's take a look here. It's actually Brady Wilmington that seems to turn the two car right into the outside wall. And Brady seems to avoid a lot of it, getting minor damage. However, Mitchell Collins and Darian Arnsdorf are not so lucky. However, besides Mitchell Collins having a lot of left side damage, I don't think that it's that bad. I think that both cars can still return in the race. I mean, if Kyle Busch can still almost finish the Talladega race after going in the air, 
Uh, it makes you wonder, can Darian Arnsdorf, who is the points leader, because if Darian Arnsdorf doesn't finish the race, then that really provides a shakeup with guys like Dan Wilkins, Ryan Adema, and Chase Buck being in contention. With that, let's take a look from the hood of the 98. And then also the number two car of Mitchell Collins. So let's see what he had to see. Since I think he got the worst damage out of the mo out of uh, the two drivers involved. Yeah, once again, not a huge tangle up that we're look that we're assessing here. It's just that Mitchell Collins came up on the 62. 62 got tangled up with him. Arnsdorf just was at the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm sure if Arnsdorf wasn't there, Collins would have been able to save it. He would have been, like, somewhere down here, and he would have been able to move on. There wouldn't have been a caution. But as they tangled up down the back stretch there, obviously, you know, with them hitting the inside wall and everything, and Mitchell Collins, as you can see here, as he comes down the racetrack, just hits the inside wall, and that gives him a little bit more damage. So there is Mitchell Collins coming down pit lane. As we take a look, what is the point for um, there's some pit stops going on. Now the question is, does that affect the lead? The question is, as we head back to the stripe here on lap 49, as we're almost a third through this race already, you have to wonder if this is going to be a race that ends up being like Martinsville, or more like, uh, or, or, or more like Walt Disney World. Or there's few real, uh, there's a few real conflicts, and it's just more of a chilled and, rel and relaxed race. You have to wonder if that's going to be the case, as David Iller is your race leader. However, he is not starting at the front of the pack because of all of the lap traffic in front of him. About half the field is not on the lead lap, but your top two are David Iller and Luis Aguilar. But coming off of turn number four, headed back to the stripe. David Iller is your race leader as we take the green flag in lap 51. And even at Martinsville in that race that had 14 cautions, there wasn't really any cautions for the first 20 laps, and then there was a huge string of caution after caution. Just like at Darlington where we saw four cautions in a row where we couldn't even complete a lap without a caution. And we can see some three wide racing here. There's Chase Buck running in fifth while his teammate and car owner Ryan Adema runs around mid-pack in 25th. There is Armin Salvador running in seventh. Your pole sitter still trying to gain some ground back. As everybody's just basically running multi-groove right now. Some guys are running the outside lane. Some guys are running the inside lane. It seems that everybody has their preferences at this racetrack, and it's not surprising to me that that is obviously the case here. As Luis Aguilar jumping on the inside, and there's Bradley Ryan in 22nd. Looks like Bradley Ryan is just going to cut down in front of David Iller. As now Luis Aguilar coming off of turn number four, he takes the lead. So the new race leader, the 55, Luis Aguilar. And actually sliding in the second is now Chase Buck, one of the most dominant drivers this season who has not yet won a race. His teammate Ryan Adema has, as he won the dollar three two fifty at Martinsville. However, Chase Buck is still winless. He's one of the more uh, talented drivers that we have in our league. He's definitely good on short tracks. He's more of an all-around good driver. As he does go on the outside, of Aguilar, as we said, that outside line does reign supreme today, and he is going to take the lead away. So Chase Buck taking the lead away and immediately going to work on the lap traffic, passing Bradley Ryman. Eventually, he's going to pass Ethan Mitchell as well, I would assume. But now Chase Buck is your race leader after Luis Aguilar only led for a few laps. Let's take a look from the 55. Good. question that has always been circulating in everybody's minds 
ever since I'd say even uh, Pocono or Watkins Glen is the streak. The streak of nine different races with nine different winners. Dan Wilkins at Daytona, Jack Husky at Homestead, Gary Arnsdorf at Walt Disney World, as I think that, yeah, Doug Dolring just took the lead. Doug Dolring just took the lead and sliding into second is now Ian Koram. There's David Iller, who was your race leader for a while. He's now back in seven. But as we were saying, there is Doug Doring. But Creed Daniel at Darlington. Santiago Alvarez at Charlotte. Ryan Adam at Martinsville. Doug Doring, your current race leader, who won at Pocono. Agristo Papa Georges at Watkins Glen. Armin Salvador in Indianapolis, and still to be decided here from Bristol Motor Speedway. As if we take a look at the different uh, race winners this year, Dan Wilkins is currently running 36, as we said. Jack Husky is no longer in the lead, un uh, no longer in the league, unfortunately. He dropped out after a few races. Um, so then. Have Arnsdorf, who won at Walt Disney, as we said, he's not running too well, and he was involved in a wreck. He's seven. Then for Darlington, we saw Creed Daniel. He's running 19th. He's actually running ahead of the leaders by a few seconds. He's with Patrick Starr, but he is uh, some of the last. He's the last two cars on the lead lap, or last three actually, since Bradley Ryman is far behind either. There's Ian Korob in second, Doug Doring in first. But then as we take a look at Santiago Alvarez, he's 28th, also a lap down. Uh, he won at Charlotte. And as we said, Ryan Adema, your winner at Martinsville. He is not too far behind. He's in 33rd. Followed by Doug Zoring, who won at Pocono. He is your race leader. Egristo Papa Georges is right there. He's 31st. He won at Martins... Er, ah, I can't talk today. Uh, he won at Indianapolis. And then Armin Salvador, probably uh, the best out of the bunch right now. He's running 14th and still on the lead lap. And I think we want to take a look at some of the uh, larger surprises that we see near the front of the field today. Probably Ian Korob running second. Ian Korob has had a lot of hope, especially with Dan Wilson's racing. Ever since he joined his first race with Charlotte, he DNF'd at Charlotte. However, he seemed to rebound doing somewhat well at Martinsville, finishing 19th at Martinsville, actually capturing the pole at Pocono, and also having a good race at Watkins Glen, and uh, unfortunately not too good of a race in Indianapolis, but he still had great fight in him. And remember, Dan Wilkins Racing is a four-car operation. You got the 77, the 16, the 60, and the 07. So these four cars, you know, they had very different stories. Dan Wilkins, Jay Monin, and Ian Korob have all sort of had roller coaster seasons. Alvarez and Wilkins have won, Monin and Korob have not. And remember that fourth spot at BWR has changed a little bit. It was Mitchell Collins who ran there until he got booted off team in exchange for Korob as he joined the league. Sort of a swap there in equipment and it's has, it hasn't really helped Collins too well. As right now he's running 41st, and that of course is attributed to the fact that he was involved in the accident earlier, which you can't imagine would help his case at all. But as we cycle back through the field, Doug Doring, your race leader on lap 76. Let's take a look from Ian Korob. second race today if he stays in the lead after this after this long. There's no guarantee of course. And now Korob jumping to the outside. Doring can't cover. Korob is gonna take the lead away. And back to the stripe the 07 of Ian Korob is your race leader. On lap 80 he takes the lead away. 
Kyle Driscoll now hunting for second place. He could make a pass to Doring. If Doring doesn't make a move, and he does not, Kyle Driscoll, and Kyle Driscoll blows up, and just as he goes into second place, he blows up and now immediately goes to pit lane. The question is, does that warrant a caution? Because imagine if he blew an engine, it would have leaked some sort of oil or something all over the racetrack, but I guess not. But how about that? The guy in second place blows an engine and now is in the garage out of the race. What an eventful turn of events, but also good news for Doug Dolan. Because even though he's a little bit further behind than he would like as he's trying to catch up to Ian Korob, you have to remember this. He almost could have gotten third. But because the guy, as soon as he passed him, blew his engine and went to the garage, that is such a incredible turn of events that you couldn't have predicted it if you did it a hundred times over. What an incredible turn of events as Doug Doring settles back into second, Chase Buck third, Gustav off the second, or Nolo Hamilton fifth, Dakota Bennett second. It's another interesting story for Dakota Bennett. You have to remember Pacific Racing, a three-car operation. Oh, one of Dakota Bennett, the 28 of Creed Daniel, who is currently running 20th, and the uh, 62 of Brady Willing. And with Bennett and Creed Daniel won at Darlington. Dakota Bennett finished second at Martinsville. And he's had other good performances as well this year. And right now he's running inside the top 10 at, uh, at Bristol. So you have to wonder, you know, the car is the 62 of Brady Wilmington. But Wilmington hasn't had the best luck. He's wrecked out in a lot of races. Uh, Daytona, he wrecked out on lap 88. He wrecked out, I believe, at Homestead. I know he wrecked out at Pocono and Indianapolis, also at uh, Martinsville. He hasn't had a good season, not because he's going out. I'm not saying that in any way. Brady Wilmington, in no way, shape, or form, has no talent. He does certainly have talent. However, it's been his bad luck attributed with his, you know, sort of wrong place, wrong time that have really made up this sort of thing where we've had uh, not a lot of success this year. As catch up possible to Ian Korob is Doug Doring again if we go to lap 91. Let's take a look as, from the 07 hood as he tries to take down these lap cars. Korob in the lead, and the guy right behind him is not on the lead lap. That is Bradley Rhyme at 19. This is when you know you have a, uh, a, a, a Bristol race with a lot of green flag runs when you have less than half the field on the lead lap. As Ian Korob went down to the apron there. Oh, we have a spin. Oh, Armin. Oh, ho, ho. I did not see that coming. Patrick Starr with a banged up car. Armin Salvador is in it. Armin Salvador looking like he was just a crush car on Monster Jam. That's why they were slowing down, because it was a wreck and I didn't see it. What the bleep happened here? Um, I can't tell you. Oh. Santiago Alvarez blew up, but before that... What in the... What in heaven's name happened here? Oh, yeah, it, yeah, it's hard to tell when, you know, you gotta go back all this time. Okay, so this is our Bristol big one, I guess you could you could say. Winty Wolf got turned by Stephanie Larson. And then right back into Armin Salvador. Remember, the 93 and the 52 are teammates. So she just essentially sabotaged Salvador, got Jay Monin in it, uh, and the reason why Santiago was blowing up was because he got hit by Winty Wolf. Then as they hit down the back stretch, you can see there's David Iller getting uh, shoved out of the way. You know, he gets turned. Dan Wilkins gets in it. Um, I'm in the helicopter view. Faris Kalel, Darian Arnsdorf, Ryan Adema, Dante Lemieux. Let's take a look from the 52 
of Armin Salvador to see what he sees during this wild crash. just tell that was a hard hard lick and now let's take a look from the uh hood of the 24 of david iller as he also had a hard lick into the inside wall while this was all unfolding and then one more roof cam from the 92 of ryan adema like we are going green this time by your race leader is Ian Cora followed by Doug Doring, Chase Buck who's coming up the second and now Emilia Nielsen making her way into the top five. So the 07 of Ian Cora will make his way back to the Geico restart zone. Green flag. outside line. It's a good thing that in these restarts, the outside line is the lead lap because that gives the lap traffic really no chance. As we are on lap 99 out of 150. Causing that huge crash didn't really get away with much damage. She had some damage on her uh, on her hood, but it's not really that much, and she's still running inside the top ten as she makes a pass on Louise Aguilar. So you know, it's it's sort of she didn't really uh, she caused the accident, yeah, but she didn't really uh, what's it called get any repercussions for it. As Winty Wolf does head down pit lane. But Doring is getting closer and closer to the 07 of the Forum. You have to wonder, is he going to make a pass or is he just going to stay complacent? Doring already has one win this year, but Doring is probably the closest man in this field that can make that um, that can make the streak go away. If Doring wins here, that will be a huge shakeup. Because remember, this is an unsponsored Pontiac. But remember, he's also running for Adam Abak Racing, and that's good equipment. So when you inherit good equipment, it doesn't matter what you have on your car, it doesn't matter what wrap you're getting from the shop, you know, you're going to have a good performance. It's like if you're a Hendrick car, but you're having some, you know, uh, sponsor. You know, it's still a good opportunity regardless, and because it's the equipment of Hendrick Motorsports, you're going to run well. Just like here with Adam Abak Racing, Adam Abak Racing has good equipment. That's why two of their guys are running in the top three right now. Doring second, Buck third, Ryan Adam on fourth, and Andy Garage, he is out for this race. But still, it's really amazing what they've done so far uh, when it comes to this race. As it looks like Amelia Nielsen did drop out of the top five. She's currently in sixth. We'll take a look from her cockpit. will lead lap number 108 out of 150. You know, it'll probably be once lap traffic starts getting in the way that we will see some uh, implications when it comes to the lead and what could happen and, you know, what might happen and everything along those lines. You can see there's the three car of Winty Wolf with the 07 of Ian Korob eagerly going behind. Yeah, 
have to wonder if once that lap traffic starts becoming a factor, which it probably won't for another 15, 20 laps, you have to wonder, is it going to affect the lead in any way? Because Coram has a good lead, and the 30 and 19 are battling for that second position. As there is a caution on the racetrack, Kestudis Ramonis with a hard hit into the inside wall. The caution is out. Oh my gosh, did he do a flip? I believe he did. So, Bryce Durlocker gets turned by Vincent Crook. And Durlocker goes into the uh, outside wall hard enough, but then Kestudis Ramonis gets quite literally turned over as he basically hops down the front stretch. Wow, that is a huge crash. While we're at it, let's take a look from the hood, or actually from the cockpit, of the 75 of Kestudis Ramonis as he goes for a wild ride. Yeah, he does a full 360 rotation down the front stretch, if we take a look. Because Durlocker got into the wall, and then Kestudis hit him, and then right there is Carl McKinney sending him up and over. Brady Wilmington got a little bit scuffled up. Dan Wilkins got in it. Agristo Papa Georges got in it pretty hard. But wow. And now let's take a look from Bryce Durlocker's view, since... He wasn't the one who started it. It was the 12 car who started it. But let's take a look from what he sees since he didn't go upside down. So there you have it from the world's fastest half mile on lap 115. We head back to the stripe. We'll see if uh, the pace car turns off its lights. And it does not. So that implicates that we still have one more lap, or at least maybe two more laps to go uh, before we go back under green. We're on lap 116 out of 150. As we cycle through the field, let's take a look at what we've got. We have Ian Korob in the lead, Doug Doring second, Chase Buck third, Bradley Rhyme in actually 15th, I apologize. Nolo Hamilton fourth, Gustave off the second fifth, Amelia Nielsen sixth, Nelson Reeves, who literally just watched his teammate flip over seventh, Jay Mon in eighth, Christian Koppel in ninth, he could have been in tenth, Faris Khalil eleventh, and then we have Stephanie Larson twelfth. Luis Aguilar, 13th, Jay Bird, 14th, and in 15th is Bradley Ryan. So right now, it is major implications as we do have just three more races after Bristol in the second, in the first half of the second season in the MSCCT. We have Bristol, then Atlanta, Talladega, and Texas. Huge implications for what could be happening in the Champions Lottery on December 5th. Headed back to the stripe, the 07 of Ian Korob in the lead, green flag on lap 118. Korob with a huge jump, that was a great jump. Korob remains the race leader. You can see here they're running multi-group, but it's mostly the cars that are on the inside. They are running, uh... Oh, wow! Mitchell Collins just got dumped by Winty Wolf, and there is no caution. Let's take a look. Yeah, that's, uh, that's... That's pretty fair and square right there. You gotta wonder, is there gonna be payback? I'd love to see payback from two guys that aren't even really in contention much. That would be funny as heck, though. That would be really funny just to see that those two battle it out. As Chase Buck could give a challenge to Doug Doring, as he jumps to the inside of the, um, of the 30, but he doesn't get there. Just all that Doug Doring has to do is get a good one off the corner, then jump to the outside, and since the outside line is running so well, he's going to end up taking the lead if he does that. And 
now Chase Buck, he's on the outside of the 30. Could he make a move? Not yet. They, they, they have an intense battle for third right now. Amelia Nielsen back into the fifth position. She's looking for her first top five. If you remember Amelia Nielsen at, in her first ever MSCCT race, or actually no, her second race, because she made her debut at Pocono. But regardless, she took the lead at Watkins Glen, had the lead for at least a few laps until with three laps to go, Patrick started to lead away from her. Now, Patrick Starr didn't even lead the race. He went to the dam, was a Christopher Papa Georgia, who is no longer on the track. He's in the garage. As now Chase Buck is falling back a little bit. He hasn't lost any spots because of how sporadic the field is. But Nolo Hamilton could make a pass for third here. That's exactly what he's going to do. Nolo Hamilton, the native of Ontario, Canada, he is going to make that pass for third. Final laps of this race run on lap 129 of 150 point. You have to wonder, Doug Doring is running out of time to make a sufficient move for the lead if he wants to win this race. He's got to make a move very quickly and very uh, soon, as now with 21 laps to go in the iHeartRadio 500, he's not going to have much time. He's not really getting much of a draft, which you don't really need much of a draft at Bristol, if we're being honest, because it's a half-mile track. Um, unless I'm completely wrong on that, then, you know, please prove me wrong. But as we have the field more, more and more spread out as we go, it's going to make making a pass for the lead much more difficult than it needs to be. So as Ian Korob gets into turn number three, they head back to the strike on lap 133. Hamilton third, there's Amelia Nielsen maybe even creeping up on Buck to make a pass for Ford. That would be her best career finish so far in her young career in the MSCCT. She made her debut at Pocono, um, and besides her incredible run at Watkins Glen, which eventually was cut short, uh, by that late pass, uh, she still got. She still has a great shot of making something big, maybe even, um, winning a race if she gets lucky uh, and if she if she uh, strikes lightning in a bottle. So there's no guarantee. As though there is a guarantee here that the lead is getting wider and wider for Ian Korov, who's out in front. 136 and we have a caution and we have a spin Dan Wilkins is in it Stephanie Larson is in it on lap 134 we go back under caution let's see what happens here oh there we go so Wilmington wrecked Wilkins and then Stephanie Larson just got caught up in let's take a look from the hood of the number 77 Dodge sponsored by the Dan Wilkins show Involved in this crash, Stephanie Larson in the number 93 Pennzoil Ford. So Larson, ironically enough, is still on the racetrack, although I don't know how she can really see out of her car with that huge, uh, th that huge crumpled up front end. I don't know how she can see, but on lap 138, boy, oh boy, is it getting, it, it, it is getting dicey, as we will now be on, looks like 12 to go. So Larson will go to pit lane like everybody else is going to stay out. We are not going to see any pit stops today. Very interesting for a 150 lap race. It does make it interesting. So 
So Ian Korob, your race leaders. Doug Doring, second. Chase Buck, third. Nolo Hamilton, fourth. Amelia Nielsen, fifth. Gustav Adolf, the second, sixth. Christian Koppel, the seventh. Jay Bird now moving up to the eighth position. Dakota Bennett, seventh. Or Dakota Bennett, ninth, sorry. And then Nelson Reeves, tenth. He's had an interesting day. Started up near the front. Uh, but he, of course, his other teammate, as due to Ramona for Martini Racing, got caught up in a flip. The last time I think I saw a flip at Bristol, ooh, I was thinking Joey Logano, but then I remembered that was 2010 at Dover. That's not Bristol. I don't remember if I've ever seen a flip at Bristol. But, you know, the MSCCT, we've seen a lot of flips, if we're being honest with ourselves. Jacob Bibido at Homestead. Uh, Tanner Berryhill at Darlington. Um, got to think here. At Martinsville, it was Nolo Hamilton. Oh, no, I don't think anybody flipped. Watkins Glen, I don't think anybody flipped. Uh, or, sorry, at Pocono, Armin Salvador flipped. Then at Indianapolis, Ferris Khalil flipped. And now at Bristol, we see... Uh, we see Kez Dudas Ramonis go up. A lot of cars on their roofs this season. We will go green with nine laps to go. Green flag in the iHeartRadio 500 at Bristol Motor Speedway. If you're Ian Korob, the one thing you don't want is another caution because you know that they won't really be able to catch up if there's another caution that will slow them down. Does Doring make a pass on the outside? He is on the outside, but he gets sort of pushed out of the way by Chase Buck. He's got to make his move fast if he wants to make that move, which you know he does. He wants that second win. This is just like his fifth race, I believe. And same with Korob. Korob and Doug Doring made their same, at, made their debut at the same race at the Coca-Cola 600 at Charlotte Motor Speedway. They come back to the stripe. Six laps to go. There's Chase Buck. He's going to get passed by Nolo Hamilton. See, that's how he They made a pass for third, but not for the lead. As if Dolan can just get on the outside of Ian Korob, it'll be simple. And he can take the lead. And now Chase Buck is going to take that lead immediately back from Nolo Hamilton. As they continue to fight down the back stretch. With four laps to go, Korob in front. You know, I definitely thought after Bristol, the streak would certainly end because of all the short track ringers that we've been known to see. Jay Monin, Ryan Adema, uh, Darian Arnsdorf, of all people. But we haven't really seen that. And now coming back to the stripe, two laps to go. For Ian Korob, Doug Doring and Chase Buck, they are teammates and they are running second and third. But coming into turn number three and exiting turn number four, Ian Korob will take the white flag one more lap to go. Just about 15 more seconds until the race concludes. Boy, oh boy. This is a streak that you would never see in NASCAR in a million years. 10 races, 10 unique winners. Ian Korob goes to victory lane at the iHeartRadio 500 at Bristol Motor Speedway. How about that? So your top 10 is Ian Korob, Doug Doring, uh, Chase Buck, Nolo Hamilton, Gate Gustav Adolf II, Jay Bird, Dakota Bennett, Jay Monin, and also Amelia Nielsen who finished fifth, but she uh, went to her pit lane so I couldn't really see it. But Ian Korob, the native of Los Angeles, California, goes to Bristol, Tennessee, and wins at the fastest half mile. We'll see you guys next time for the SunTrust 195, or sorry, SunTrust 400, that's what it was called last year. The SunTrust 400 from Atlanta Motor Speedway, we'll see you guys next time.